to Luke chapter 12. Um, the Lord just kind of really brought this chapter to me this week. And it was actually on, I think it was Monday or, or Tuesday that the Lord brought this to me. And as I started reading it, I, it was just like the thought came in. What if the election don't go like you think it should? And right away I was, oh no. <laughs> but, you know, this is a, it's a really neat chapter. If, if I step down one, can you still do it? Um, yeah. Okay, can you still? Yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> Amen. What? The microphone. Okay. A little bit. It's about like, is that about okay? Right? Do that like that. Okay. Okay. One of the, one of the things, uh, as we look at Luke chapter 12, and this morning I, I guess I'm going to do more of a Bible study than I am maybe just preaching or anything like that. But anyway, as we look to the Word, is what's important, right? And Lord, I just thank you that you might bring the word out this morning, Lord. And I seek your help and I seek your anointing. But most of all, Lord, I know that it's your word that can touch our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. When you look at, at this uh, chapter, uh, my Bible calls this chapter Warnings and Encouragements. And as you look through it, it's a long chapter. And we find the parable of the rich fool. We also find in verse 22, do not worry. And then when you come down to 35, it says watchfulness. And then when you come to 49, it's bringing not peace, but division. And then when you go to 54, it says interpreting the times. And you know, it just kind of just hit me that day. And so this morning I would like to kind of start off, and I'm just going to use the, the first few verses in this chapter, uh, probably get through verse 5 or so, and then we're going to go from there and look at some other things that's with it. But in this message, we find that, meanwhile, it says, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, isn't that kind of interesting? There is so many people there that, I mean, they're just crowded, trampling on one another. But you know, as Jesus gets up to speak, he's focusing on his disciples. Anyway, that just kind of really touched me. How many know that God's message is still focusing on his disciples? Amen? It's on us. And then, you know, as I, I look at this first, at the second verse, notice what it says. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And, you know, I, I looked that word, and my, my Bible's got a whole page of study on hypocrisy. And we're not going to go through all that this morning. But anyway, I just want to touch on it. Hypocrisy. Jesus warning his disciples to be careful that this sin does not enter their lives and ministry. To be careful that this sin, and you know, as I, as I was going through this, and as we look at this, we realize that, you know, yeah, we're praying for our country, and we're praying for all of these other, all of the things that's going on in this world. But how many know that we also need to be dealing with this part. Amen. Amen. All of that part needs to be really worried with. Jesus is warning them to be careful. Hypocrisy means acting as if you are what you are not. For an example, acting publicly as a godly and faithful believer when in reality you harbor an indictive habit or some other hidden sin such as lust, greed, jealousy or bitterness. The hypocrite is a deceiver 
in the area of the observable. Right? He's wanting to be seen as righteousness. He's not being open. <laughs> I'll read just a little bit more here. Since hypocrisy involves living a lie, it means that one is living under the dominion of Satan, the father of lies. Jesus warns his disciples that all hypocrisy and hidden sin can be exposed, if not in this life, certainly on the day of judgment. And I'll, like, I'll go on and read just a little more in the Bible here. It says, There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. Verse 2. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after, killing, after the killing of the body has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. You know... When you read these first five verses, I've come to a place where, you know, being ready for Christ is serious, right? There's nothing that you can kind of hide or, you know, sometimes when company comes, you've got things that you could put in the other room, right? Put it in the closet. <laughs> you, could, you, you could hurry up and say, I hope they don't see this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it just goes through all of, all of this, this, this part. Um, Jesus warns his disciples that all hypocrisy and hidden sin will be exposed, if not in this life, but certainly in the day of judgment. Hypocrisy is a sign that one does not fear God. You know, lots of times we do the judging. We think, well, I think I'm good enough. I think I'm okay. And it does not possess the Holy Spirit with His regenerating grace. How will you escape being condemned to hell? For the fifth verse says, the disciples of Jesus must stand in awe of God's majesty and holiness and His wrath against sin. And you know, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 6, and this is, this is kind of interesting, and I guess one of the things is I was reading this and studying, <laughs> or just kind of reading over this, and anyway, and I saw Isaiah chapter 6, and I thought, you know, I haven't been there for a while, but I, I kind of know what that says. <laughs> it's talking about Isaiah. And if you want to turn with me there to Isaiah chapter 6. <coughs> In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And you know, my Bible calls it seraphs. And you know, I was thinking, that there's got to be angels, like, you know. And I looked up in, in, in my Bible here, seraphs are angelic beings of high order. The word may be another designation for the living creatures revealed elsewhere in Scripture. Their title, literally, is called burning one. may signify their purity as those who serve God around His throne. They so reflected God's glory that they seemed to be on fire. Isn't that awesome? Holy, holy, holy 
The foremost characteristic of God revealed to Isaiah is his holiness, signifying his purity of character, separation from sin, and opposition to all that is evil. God's absolute, holy, absolute holiness must be proclaimed in the churches as it's proclaimed in the heavens. Notice what they were saying. At the sound of their voices, verse 4, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isn't that awesome? You know, here we find Isaiah. God had a plan for Isaiah's life. God had a purpose for Isaiah's life. And you know, God gave him this vision that he might, you might say, I could use all kinds of words, eligible, <laughs> to do what God has called him to do. And you know, as we go on with that, notice what this is what... He, he thought, but one of the things I'd like to I'd like to just to turn over to is chapter Revelation chapter one, and we're, we're just going to look at you know one of the things that really kind of touched me as I was doing that I thought you know John he had a very much that kind of same revelation when you look at at John chapter one. I'll just read just a, a few verses in here this morning. Let's we'll begin with the 13th verse. All right? Okay. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. That's what John saw when he saw Jesus. Amen. So we go back to Isaiah this morning. And we and we look at that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. You know, this is what he saw. And he also saw himself. Amen. All the all who approach God must have their sins forgiven and their hearts cleansed by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning with the 19th verse, is a really, I think it really uh, speaks to us right there. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Isn't that awesome? Notice what the Bible says as we, as we see Him. You know, I, going back to Isaiah, then he says, then I heard a voice. Oh, actually, let me go back to, to 6. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my <clears throat> mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and you're soon atoned for. You know, that was a picture, remember, as you go back into Leviticus and so on, and you find the priest went behind the curtains and so on, those coals were there. 
they were there. And one of the things that, that kind of really, uh, to me, was one of the things is I was thinking about that the priest went in there, and you know, nobody could go in there except the priest. And you know, they even had to put a rope on his foot in case he wasn't <laughs> cleansed to drag him out, right? He would die. Those coals. And then when you see the description of Christ in Revelation right there, and you see this part and you think, oh wow, that, that, is, that is awesome. But you know, over in Exodus 33, I think seven, beginning with the 17th verse, is an, is an interesting verse. I think it's something that we should look at it today. Exodus, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles or it'll be up on the board. This is quite the verse. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked me. Because I'm pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, You cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. One day we're going to see him face to face. Well... You know, and after, after this took place, and after this vision, and this time that Isaiah had, we find the Lord said, Who shall I send, and who will go for me? And I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go, and tell these people. Be ever hearing, but never understanding. Being ever seeing, but never perce perceiving. Make the heart of these people callous. Make their ears dull. Close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes or hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. And you know, I'm not sure where I discovered this, but years ago I remember studying on Isaiah. And you know, there was hardly even one person that really turned to God in the years that he brought. And you know, when you turn to, to Matthew 28, and you know we find that we're living in the, in the days that we're living in, and we're praying for our country, and we're praying for people to come to Christ, and we're praying for revival. And you know, it's so, it's so exciting and so neat that we find Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of this age. You know, Jesus said he'll go with us. And then we turn to Matthew 24. And we'll begin with the 10th verse. And these are the words that we read when we begin with the 10th verse. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but he who stands in the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And you know, I think we're living in that day. 
We're living in that time. If that command to go grips our hearts, we must respond the same way Isaiah did. Here am I. Send me. You know, I believe we're living in that day when each one of us that walks out this door, we're going to our mission field. You know, I believe we're living in that time when we need to be doing it. He is saying that we're living in a day where there's an increase of wickedness. And you know, when we see all this, the first thing that kind of really touched my heart was, then the end will come. Then the end will come. And you know, as I was just kind of reading this and studying this the other day, that was before I, the election. <laughs> And it just kind of seemed to hit me. This election is not going to go like you think. And yet at the same time I thought, oh no, Trump, he's going to make it. <laughs> but I had that same feeling in here. Amen. Then the end will come. Christ speaks to the disciples as though everything he predicts could be fulfilled in their generation. And you know, going back to Luke, there are people, so many people, they were stumbling over each other, there were so many people trying to be in there where they could hear or see. And what did Jesus do? He spoke to his disciples. And you know, I thought, yes, we're praying for our country. We're praying for our family. We're praying for our president. We're praying for all of these. We're praying God's will and God's purpose be done. And you know, when we look at other parts in the Bible, we find out that we're living in the same time that Isaiah was living, or very similar to the same things going on. And you know, when we look in the Bible and we look at what God says is going to happen in the last days, that's what they're going to see. Amen? You know, God's, God don't want to see one soul miss heaven because of his love for them. But you know, God has given us a will. And we're living in a time when I believe that we've got to be willing to go. We need to be willing to share Christ. We need to be willing to pray. Then the end will come. Christ speaks to the disciples as though everything he predicts could be fulfilled in their generation. This was the hope of the New Testament church. It must also be the hope of all who believe in Jesus Christ throughout the ages. We are to hope that the Lord will return and that the end will occur in our generation. And you know, there's people that don't really want to hear that Christ is coming soon. I had a person tell me that the other day. He said, I don't want to hear that. And you know, they look back and they see. And, and I've read different things and I won't go into all of them. But you know, there hasn't, there's been several times when people thought that Christ was coming. They predicted when Christ was coming. And then when he didn't come, the 80s. How many remember the predictions in the 80s, right? And then when he didn't come, what does people end up doing? They move away. Yep, they move away. It's, it's amazing. But you know what? Um, I still believe that Christ is coming soon. I still believe we need to be ready. You know, we need to be ready. I'd like to close with 1 Corinthians, if you'd like to turn with me there, chapter 15. I'd just like to close, close with this part. And we'll look at verse, we'll start with verse 51 and 15. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we'll all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, 
The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must close itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, isn't that neat? <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, it talks our labor is not in vain. Isaiah's labor was not in vain. God was looking for a man that would go. And you know, when he had that experience with God, he said, here am I. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and you know, I feel like we're living in a day when we all need to be saying, here am I. Well, I don't think so-and-so will believe. I'm not going there. Or I don't think this. Or I don't think that. But you know what? God says I need to go. We need to tell. We need to share. We need to love. Yeah, oh, Tony? Um, just going back to Biden. Biden told us what he was going to do. And you still got people voting for him. Yep. God has told us what he's going to do through the word. And you still do not have people that believe he will do it. So, you know, there's Amen. Thank you. Good word. Thank you. <laughs> but that's sure enough true, isn't it? It is true. Well, and I wanted to tell you, my, my Luke 12 in my Bible is called Can't Hide Behind a Religious Mask. I, I knew I was, I was going to be a little bit short on time, but uh, one of the things in my Bible, Mark, is, a, is another one that really comes out and hits this part. And I wasn't able to, to get to that. But also, in, in my Bible, there's a place that... that Anyway, it's where false teachers and how to recognize them and, and, and show them. And it says that, that there's going to be false teachers coming. And they may look like they're right. And they may be... And some of them drift away. But you need to really be careful. You need to really check things out. Amen? Because, you know, we're living in a time when, when they can make all kinds of things look right, right? Amen. And, you know, just like you might say, there's a lot of them running for office, and they can make things sound right, but it's not right. Amen? They're, they're not really telling you their goal or their purpose. Well, if no one tells you the gospel... They can't tell you that Jesus died for your sins mm -hmm. and that you're a sinner and need to repent. Mm -hmm. If they never say that, then you need to be concerned. Amen. You, know, so you just need to be concerned. Mm -hmm. So, so true. Praise God. They should be concerned about their sin and your sin. The beginning of uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 this morning, if you read that, yeah. it says, But false prophets also arise among the people, mm -hmm. just as there will be false teachers among you, you will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right there. That was one of the scriptures I was thinking of going yeah. to. But uh, I had... Uh, if you, do you mind if I just share a, 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 some from Mark, just in, in closing? Because Mark, it, it, anyway, it's just really... Uh, it's how much that Mark and get back here. <laughs> Try to turn really fast and I can't get there really quick. Okay. Mark 4, 20, beginning with verse 22. For whatever 
is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. It's kind of neat, isn't it? And then if you turn with me to, to Mark chapter 13... I'd like to begin with the fifth verse in Mark chapter 13. Get my pages so I get across here. And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. And there he says again, you must be on your guard. Pretty awesome, isn't it? And then if we just jump from there over to verse 22. Notice, for the false Christ to the false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following the distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? And yet, you know, I, I, I feel that time is, is coming. It's soon. And you know, there, there's so many other verses that we could go on and on, but I don't want to hold you <laughs> long. <laughs> but praise God. Thank you, Lord. But it just kind of just sort of light. And when I, when I, when I was, like I say, the, it was just like the Holy Spirit was right there with me as I was reading and studying that, and, and I thought, you know, that thought came to me. The election may not go that way, but then be ready for the other way. Amen? And you know, as, as you look at Luke chapter 12, and you see all the different things that Jesus brought to the multitudes of people, and yet, he zeroed in on his disciples. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Praise God. Shall we stand together this morning? Anyway, when I got through, I thought, you know what? I'm going to preach on Luke 12 <laughs> and Mark. <laughs> but, no, I'm teasing. But Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I, I just want to thank you for you being with us here this morning. And Lord, it's not something to be laughing about, but Lord, it's something to be serious about. And Father, I pray that you'll help us as we leave today to go out, Lord, into the mission field where you have placed us. Lord, that we might be able, Lord Jesus, To share the light that you have given us. To share the love that you have given us. Oh God, help us, Lord, to see and to feel, Lord Jesus, what you see and what you feel. Lord, may our heart be connected to your heart. Oh God. And Lord, I thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.